This video will be quick, or at least the writing of it will be quick. I've explored further into the work of Franz Austin as he collaborated with Himanshu Ray in India, and so this brings me to a 1928 feature titled Shiraz. Like 1925's Delight of Asia, Shiraz was penned by Niranjan Pal. Shiraz is a retelling of the circumstances which allegedly led to the inspiration for the construction of the most legendary Taj Mahal. Any fans of Brazilian music know that number. Shiraz had also been adapted, as was the prior Light of Asia, from a play written by Niranjan Pal. Historically, the Taj Mahal was commissioned by the Mughal Emperor in India at the time, Shah Jahan, as the tomb for his deceased wife, Mumats Mahal. What well, may be complete fiction, I didn't see immediate verification for this, but maybe stranger things have happened. The deceased lady's tomb, the Taj Mahal, was designed by a man who had been in love with her his entire life. In the story of Shiraz, Mumats Mahal was separated from her family and taken in by a potter's. The son of the potter was Shiraz, and he fell for her and followed her to the city of Agra after, as a young adult, she was kidnapped by slavers and sold to be the bride of the prince. Shiraz is portrayed by Himanshu Ray. I don't think Shiraz is actually a historical figure, although it's a nice story, I think. It is funny, popular knowledge probably holds the Taj Mahal as a Hindu religious site, though it was constructed during the Mughal era and is rather an Islamic artifact. It might seem bizarre to some of us that certain extreme Hindu nationals in India today wish to de-emphasize the Taj Mahal as an encapsulation of India's cultural history or utilize some bogus historical revisionism to claim that a Hindu kick in fact built centuries earlier. There is a magnificent Jorge Borges short story, one I recorded a crude audiobook for actually, titled The Man on the Threshold. Borges relays an apparently, although maybe not, old saying that India is bigger than the entire world. I once mentioned this quotation to an Indian friend who smiled, nodded, and accepted the metaphor without it phasing her, seemingly agreeing with or understanding its implied message. Amazing that one place could feel this way, and that descriptor is not just some vaguely orientalist oddness. Or maybe she was just being polite to me. I'm going to now read out some information provided by the always useful for Indian cinema information, indiancine.me entry for Shiraz. It is pasted information from Suresh Chabria's edition, uh, oh, excuse me, he, he edited, uh, I, I believe, what's called Light of Asia, Indian Silent Cinema, 1912 to 1934. Let's read this out. After Prem Sanyas and some German films, Austin returned to India for his second collaboration with Rai, an historical romance set in the Mughal Empire, subtitled, like, Prapancha Pash, 1929, A Romance of India. Salima, an Akshi, is a princess foundling raised by a potter and loved by her brother Shiraz. <coughs> Excuse me, Shiraz, Rai. She's abducted and sold as a slave to Prince Kuram, later Emperor Shah Jahan, Roy, who also falls for her, to the chagrin of the wily Dahlia, Sita Devi. When Salima is caught with Shiraz, the young man is condemned to be trampled to death by an elephant. A pendant reveals Salima's royal status and she saves her brother, marries the prince and becomes Empress Mumtaz Mahal, while Dalb is banned for her machinations against Salima. When Salima dies, 1629, the emperor builds her a monument of the design of the now old and blind Shiraz, the Taj Mahal. The film contains a number of passionate kissing scenes. The cinematography receives favourable comment, introducing a Baroque camera style that became inescapably linked with the genre of Mughal romances, for example, Sharu Roy's Loves of a Mughal Prince and... Shaljuri's Anarkali, both also 1928. I apologize if I don't pronounce these to um, the way they're meant to, some of these names. The art direction was by Promod Naf. The German release had a music score by Arthur Gutman. It was a slightly, sh slightly shorter version at 8,402 feet. The US release credited the assistant director V. Piers as co director of an 80 inch. 80, I don't know what that symbol is. We don't have the imperial system here in Australia. A version in 1929. The surviving print at the NFAI is 7,778 feet. Okay. Suresh Chabria writes, 
Austin, Rai, and Pal tackle another great Indian story, the building of the Taj Mahal, and the result is a truly beautiful work of filmic atmosphere and emotion. Hassan, a potter living in the Persian desert, finds Salima, a princess, and raises her along with his son, Shiraz. Under his benign gaze, they mature into young sweethearts. But Salima is abducted by slave traders and sold to the Mughal prince Kuram, who falls in love with her. This upsets the wily court lady Dahlia's plans of becoming empress and she arranges a secret meeting between the lovelorn Shiraz and Salima. The two are seen by Kuram, who condemns Shiraz to be trampled by an elephant. Salima successfully pleads for mercy and Shiraz reveals the pendant which signifies her royal descent. Salima and Kuram marry, leaving Shiraz to keep a ceaseless vigil outside the palace gate. Salima is given the title Mumtaz Mahal when Kuram succeeds to the throne as Emperor Shah Jahan. When the Empress dies 18 years later, Shah Jahan orders that a monument is built in her memory such as the world has never seen. <coughs> Excuse me. The design chosen by the Emperor is that of Shiraz, who is now blind but has rendered its, his memories into stone. The film ends in the gardens of the Taj Mahal with the bereaved Emperor and the blind architect consoled by the fact that the monument has immortalised the woman they both loved. Shiraz is perhaps even more orientalist and exotic than Prem Sanyasin. Papancha Pasha and fully exploits the Mughal style architecture and costumes and lustrous images that evoke the grandeur of the great Mughals. This theme has been repeatedly filmed in both the silent and talky eras, but rarely of such aplomb. The German reviewers were once again enthusiastic, but in India its thunder was stolen by quickly made rival productions based on similar stories, Chara Roy's Loves of a Mughal Prince and Asi Chudari's Anarkali, both made in 1928. Very interesting indeed. Let's read Kenneth Turin's review, while I apparently still have free articles for the Los Angeles Times website. NYT has barred me for my insistence upon free journalism. Well, not outright, they just prefer money. I'm not even sure if the LAT has this free fee barrier or if they simply run ads. They made me pause my ad block here. So this is Turin's piece. I'll never forget the first time I saw Shiraz, and if you take a chance in taking this gorgeous silent extravaganza, a landmark of Indian cinema, you will surely feel the same. Playing January 22nd for one night, only at a quartet of Lam... I don't... L-A... I I can't pronounce it. L-A-E-M-M-L-E theatres. 1928's Shiraz, A Romance of India, caused a sensation when it appeared accompanied by an Indian ensemble at 1994's Gione del Cinema Muto Silent Film Festival in Pordenon, Italy. Now of the benefit of a meticulous 2K restoration by the British Film Institute and a spectacular score composed by... Anushka Shankar, who also can be heard on the sitar, this epic of exoticism is coming to its natural big screen home. For those who don't know, Anushka Shankar is indeed the more talented of Ravi Shankar's two daughters. For this sumptuous fictional reworking of the romantic origins of the Taj Mahal does not stint on scale, blessed with a cast of literal thousands, not to mention camels, elephants and horses without number, this film is more than set in 17th century India, it transports you back to that time and place. Though its subject matter and its cast are completely Indian, Shiraz was directed by the German Franz Austin, responsible for a trilogy of Indian silence, Light, and of, Light of Asia and the marvellous Afro of Dice are the other two. The driving force of the movie, however, was its Indian producer and co-star Himansu Ray, who dreamed of making his country a player on the global film scene and eventually set up the legendary Bombay Talkies production company. Part of the reason Shiraz is so spectacular is, according to an article by Suresh Chabria, former director of India's National Film Archive, the persuasive power of its principles. Somehow they persuaded India's richest Maharajas, the rulers of Jaipur, Udaipur and Mysore, to not only make their elaborate Mughal-era palaces available as locations, but to also supply the rich costumes and jewellery, the numerous animals and the hordes of armed men who play a part in the story. And true to its intentions, Shiraz, shot by Emil Shunaman and Henry Harris, is drenched in visual exoticism, including everything from trained monkeys and dangerous snakes to rings that dispense hidden poison. Traditional customs are also given their due, as soothsayers and fortune tellers are regularly consulted and the threat of death by elephant's foot is given an airing. That's something you don't hear every day. Set over three centuries ago, Shiraz starts off for bang as an impressive camel caravan is attacked by wave after wave of ruthless bandits. Many die, but a baby princess escapes harm. She's found by a humble village potter who names her Salima and raises her as a sibling to her son Shiraz, a young man who has quite the future predicted for him by a local fortune teller. For this child, Shiraz, great things will come from the desert. Love, sorrow, and fame immortal. The adult Shiraz, producer Rai, 
grows up to fall in love with Salima and actually Rama Rao, but she complicates matters by thinking of him only as a brother. Speaking of complications, Salima is kidnapped by vile slave traders and ends up as part of the harem of the benevolent Prince Karum, Charu Roy, in the great city of Agra. Impressed by her fortitude, the prince begins a delicate courtship of Salima, while Shiraz, fearing the worst and aided by the beautiful but treacherous Dahlia, Sita Devi, puts together an elaborate plan with saving her in mind. Much of this plays out gloriously, if not surprisingly, and Shiraz's final section, a totally fictitious riff on the inspiration for and the construction of the Taj Mahal, is also unexpectedly moving. Because silent films are never silent, with music accounting for what is considered to be half of a movie's impact, Shiraz's terrific Shankar score, played by nine musicians, is essential in heightening every emotion and moment of tension. They were the movies until sound came in. Calling them silent suggests they were lacking something, film historian Kevin Brownlow famously wrote. Take a look at Shiraz and you'll see what he means. Kevin Brownlow is one of the two credited directors on the magnificent uh, Hollywood, a story of the story of the American silent film uh, documentary miniseries from 1980, which is phenomenal, absolutely magical. If you can view that on YouTube, you may as well. It's a long time, but if you have that time, oh, it'll you won't waste it by watching Kevin Brownlow's miniseries Hollywood, story of the American silent film. And now, because I appreciate it when I can just read articles about any irritating dramas, free journalism indeed, right? Here's Peter Bradshaw in The Guardian. This 1928 silent film, now restored by the BFI, is a startlingly ambitious, epic, weepy romance filmed entirely on location in India, and is of far more than just archival interest. Taking creative flight from a historical record, it reimagines the story of the Mumtaz Mahal, the 17th century Mughal empress in India whose death so devastated the emperor that he commissioned the monument to her in Agra, now known as the Taj Mahal. Thanks, Nob. The film invents new backstory for the empress. As a little girl, she is ambushed with her mother by bandits in the desert and rescued by a family with no clue of her noble identity, although an amulet is to be the proof. They bring her up as a little sister to their son, Shiraz, in adulthood, Shiraz, played by the film's producer star Hamansu Ray, remains deeply in love with this girl named Salima and Akshi Ramu Rao. When she is kidnapped by slavers and sold into the harem of the emperor, poor Shiraz hangs around the palace gate, trying to gain admittance even as the emperor falls in love with her and she with him. Shiraz is threatened with all sorts of punishments and tortures and grows old and blind as a beggar outside the palace, because Salima could only think of him as a brother. But after her death, he is to achieve a redemption by designing her famed marble mausoleum in a blind, visionary ecstasy. The crowd scenes and the location work in this film are a real marvel, and there is great tenderness to its final act. And now, how about some IMDb reviews? From Moz Jukin, late silent film shot in India is a fascinating oddity. Not a great movie, really. With none of the flamboyant technique characteristic of the last great silence, the wind, asphalt, sunrise... The wind and sunrise are the high. That's, that's a pretty tall order of competition, to be fair. But the mix of German expats, British scripting, and Indian subject matter filmed on location remains an intriguing novelty. The plot, with the scheming highborn lady, Fava, to become princess and later empress of India, I would dare anything, introducing an old flame into the women's quarter to discredit the heir's true love, is simple stuff which seems to belong to a period of filmmaking from years earlier. Playing is at least restrained. The film's major appeal is its is in placing its action against attractive, genuine Indian buildings in the occasional vista. There's a bit of suspense from the likelihood that a real elephant will stomp the admirer. The hint of exotic sadism which runs through these European visions of the mysterious East, kismet or films like Das Indisch Grabmal and Emerald of the East, is clear, as with demanding that the model maker's already blind eyes be put out. The ending with the Empress' two favourite admi uh, devoted admirers sitting in front of the Taj Mahal is telling. This one survives in a particularly sharp, well-graduated copy, one of the best circulating, even if it isn't tinted. A pity the Sydney Film Festival, after bringing it halfway round the planet, ran it too fast, but the Tunji Bayer, Lindsley Pollock, score they put with it was excellent. Ah, oh, so this guy's based in Sydney also. Interesting. It's weird. I just want to go on a little tangent here. Um, not a great movie. Um... IMDb fostered a culture of there was only 250 great movies ever made and everything else is just like substandard. The fact that VHS and DVD rips of films or a lot of DVD rips of older films were just not up to scratch. And it wasn't until Blu-ray where we started seeing um, films in, not that there aren't crappy Blu-ray transfers here and there, obviously, but 
um, it wasn't until some, you know, people would start watching some of these older films and say, oh wait, these were extraordinary. You know, only really big films were getting good DVD transfers, we have to remember. Um, and now that we no one gives a stuff about IMDb anymore, it's like, oh yeah, they, there can be many, many interesting films. There's, there doesn't just have to be 250 quality films at any given freaking time in history. Um, but, you know, I'm glad we realise that now. Here's another one from, from Jazz... Uh, J... J-A-S-Z-S. Courtly love and intrigue. Timeless. Free binge courtesy of IMDb and loved it. More moved than I thought I would be in. Anushka Shankar really adds to the film like all great film music. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Then from Bob Lipton. Oh, Bob's given it a 6 out of 10. Okay, what have you got to say, Bob? Story of the Taj Mahal. The movie begins with a young Indian princess on a caravan across the Persian desert. Raiders strike and the girl is found and succored by a village potter. After she has grown into Cedar Devi, she is seized and sold to Prince Charu Roy. Her adoptive brother, Himansu Ray, follows and proclaims her a free woman, which does no good. Roy loves her, but cannot make her his empress because he can only marry a princess, which no one knows she is. It's a story of how the Taj Mahal came to be built, and it's given a fairy tale cast with some striking visuals. It's directed by Franz Austin, a German who moved to India in 1924 to make movies there until 1939. Eventually, he was seized by British authorities. He had joined the Nazi party in 1936. Oh, no. He was... No, don't join that party, dude. He was released in 1940 and returned to Germany, where he died in 1956, just shy of his 80th birthday. Uh, you don't, you don't want to get involved in that crowd, Austin. Shiraz, A Romance of India Review, from Joey the Brit. Ah, very cool. One of a trilogy of Indian slash UK co-productions... Uh, Indian German, dude. Um, co-productions produced by and starring Himansu Ray. Shiraz invents a romantic backstory to the building of the Taj Mahal, which, for the final reel at least, really tugs on the heartstrings. The location photography is stunning, but the acting is woeful and the story is stretched pretty thin. No, the acting's okay. It's, what are you going to do? You know, it's, just, it's a silent film, Anyway, another strong film from Franz Austin and Himanshu Ray. He stars as Shiraz, written by Niranjan Pal. Shiraz is worth exploring. <laughs>